From 3 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, Buffalo Wild Wings Happy Hour has beer, cocktails, and bar food for 3 to 6 bucks. It's the perfect way to offset a long day. Text that hilarious joke about your boss to your boss. What? No, no. Try a $4 Coors Light Tall. Set your morning alarm for 6 p.m. That calls for $5 strawberry margaritas. So if you ask your phone why you're still single and... Ha, ha, ha. Seriously? Head to Buffalo Wild Wings Happy Hour from 3 to 6. At participating locations, taxes and fees apply. Dine-in only. Drink responsibly. Offers vary by location. Void where prohibited. Welcome to The Vault Podcast. Classic music reviews. Presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and The Crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. To another edition of the Vault Podcast, Classic Music Reviews. Presented by IV Creative, it's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and shout out to the crew. We are going to reunite once again here on this summer, but you know how the things are. Things are very busy, but shout out to Damo and J.O. For always holding it down for your boy. And shout out to the fans out there. Y'all have been doing an absolute wonderful job of spreading the word and getting it out there. The numbers definitely reflect it. I want to give a big shout out to everybody out there on TikTok who definitely followed the show and also gave props on the video on grams that we put up on there, including the Amory one, which as of today has over 23,000 views and hundreds of comments. So Thank you all for continuing to follow us. Make sure that you're going to vaultclassicpod.com. You can get to all of our social media there, including TikTok. And make sure that you're also there following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you continue to spread the word out there during this summer. We had that recap of the summer of 02 last weekend. Guess what? We're going to keep it going sometime later this summer. We're going to have a recap, hopefully, of the summer of 97. And also the summer of 92, so that you all can get an idea of the great summer classics that came out of those years. As we always like to say here on The Vault, our motto is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics or MBTC. And today, we're going to go back 25 years ago. This week, we'll be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the debut studio album of none other than Missy Misdemeanor Elliot, Super Duper Fly. Released on July 15th, 1997 on Goldmine and Electra Records. It was recorded in 1997. Conceptualized between 96 and 97. It was recorded at the Master Sound Studios in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Shout out to VA. With a runtime of 60 minutes and 6 seconds. The producers on this, executive producers as well, entirely by Missy and also none other than Timbaland. Four singles released from Super Duper Fly. The most popular one, the lead single released July 2nd, 1997, was The Rain. The second, Socket to Me, featuring The Brat, released September 21st, 1997. Beat Me 911, released in March of 1998, and then Hit Him With The He in April of 1998. So, Missy Super Duper Fly, 25 years later. It's crazy. <laughs> and so... It's wild that, you know, thinking back now on all these years, the things that she has accomplished in the music industry and what Timbaland has become, not just in hip hop, but in the music industry as well, is really ridiculous considering that it didn't just start 25 years ago. The background about Missy, she started a group originally called Phase, later became known as Sister. Everybody now knows the group that Missy, Sister, that she was a part of with three of her friends in Virginia. That group was signed, of course, by Devontae Swing, who was a member of the R&B group. Jodeci had started his Swing Mob record label. He signed them to his label. And as a result of that, they were on the label. They recorded an album, but the album was never released and their recording contract was terminated. So afterwards, Missy goes back to Virginia where she links up with Timbaland and they start writing and producing songs. Their big contribution, of course, starting together was them working together on Aaliyah's One in the Million album released the previous year in 1996. So Missy signed to Electric Records on a solo deal. Then she's also given her own record label, which when you think about it is a little unprecedented. Someone who had been in the record industry for a while, writing and also producing songs, but had never released an album themselves and was also given her own record label with Goldmine. And 
she started out in the recording sessions of Super Duper Fly, which only took a very short amount of time. And I wanted to speak about that in this article that I read on Rock the Bells about Missy Super Duper Fly and its importance in regards to where it stands in the game. Now, that first single that came out with The Rain was something that was released in the beginning of July of 1997, kind of hit us all out there out of nowhere. And I mean, it was something, the sound was unique, and it wasn't the first time that the public at large was exposed to Missy, because in the previous year, we had heard her not only singing background vocals on Aaliyah's debut album and host or co-writing and producing some of those songs, but... Everybody now popularly knows the one that I think that we all know her from was from the the Things That You Do by Gina Thompson, the Bad Boy remix where she was on there and had that memorable verse that she spit that kind of got everybody first acclimated to her unique style. But I wanted to take a little bit and talk about this article from Super Duper Fly and before I get into my initial reactions. This article from Rock the Bell states about how this was right in the midst of not too long after the deaths of Tupac and Biggie. Then it was talking about where the game was at that particular time. And it says it would become one of the greatest years in the genre's history with landmark releases from Jay-Z, Wu-Tang, Notorious Big, and then none other than Missy Misdemeanor Elliott. Her debut album, Super Duper Fly, would take music into a new sonic and visual wonderland. And as an audience, we were ready for someone to lead us into the future. She was and still is a rare artist. Missy can sing, rap, write, dance, and produce. She is technically impeccable with the ability to improvise, sexually playful while resisting the male gaze, charmingly shy but has a commanding presence. Her versatility, talent, and passion were apparent from the start, but what was most exciting in an era populated by hardcore and hypersexualized personality was her innovation. When the public met her in the summer of 97, Missy was already an established industry juggernaut. She, along with her childhood friend, Timothy Timberland Mosley, solidified themselves as a dynamic producing duo, working with acts like Jodeci, SWV, Destiny's Child, New Edition, Puff Daddy, Mary J. Blige, and most notably, Aaliyah. Even with all her success behind the scene, Missy decided to take center stage. She recorded Super Duper Fly in two weeks with Timberland as the sole producer. She would later tell interviews, I did this album for my fans, she didn't need the money. It was about her artistic expression. So that, I think, perfectly sets us up to go into first thoughts and reflections. So summer of 97, as I've mentioned on some earlier podcasts, this is the summer after my freshman year in high school. We're heading into this summer. It's really interesting summer because I'm not working at this particular time. Um, what I am doing pretty much is chores around the house. And also when I don't have chores, I'm going out hanging around the neighborhood. I'm playing basketball, going over to friends' house, playing video games, hanging outside, chilling with people, with other friends. Ice cream truck comes around, you know, summer stuff. This album drops and the single for The Rain drops right in the midst of this summer, right when it's getting into full swing. So the first single drops and then also the video drops alongside with it. I think it's important to note the single and also the video together because to me, they're inseparable. You have to mention one along with the other. So the song drops on the radio and it hits like a bomb. It's popular. You hear it on all the daytime countdowns and also all the nighttime countdowns with 95.5. They had the top five at five and then the countdowns at seven and the midday countdowns. It was number one on all of them. But then we get into the video and then the video took the song to a whole new level. It was, as the article said, a visual wonderland. So you have Missy. She has on in one scene, has those crazy sunglasses with the trash bag outfit. Then there's also the yellow jumpsuit. And then there's the scene where there's like the mirrors, of course. And then you have cameos from so many different people in that video. There's Diddy. There was, I believe, Total. There was Lil' Kim and Lil' C's. There was so many different cameos in that video. The Brat. I mean, all these folks that came in to do this. And then visually, it was sort of like trippy. Like, 
That's why I think, and it's ironic that like Busta was on this album, almost like they were sort of doing the same thing. Like visually, they were going for the same motifs in their videos. Like, you know, Busta, The Coming kind of had, you know, some basic videos. I mean, the Wuha one was kind of a little bit out there. But when we got to When Disaster Strikes, is when you saw the artistry, the visual difference in some of the videos when Busta did When Disaster Strikes, especially with the put your hands where my eyes can see and then dangerous and and light it up like where the videos would trip you out. And so you got this same thing during this video. So it was you had the single, but then the video sort of brought the song to another level. It like made it so popular because it was like one of those videos that when you saw it, it was just like, man, this is <laughs> this is wild. You know, like you would look at it and visually it would trip you out, but you couldn't like look away from it. So the rain drops. And this song is bumping throughout most of the summer. It's, you know, the song itself is crazy. They took the sample from the Ann Pebble song, I Can't Stand the Rain, 1973. And then it was the production. I mean, the production was absolutely bananas, not just on that song, but as we would come to find out later on in the entire album, with Timberland producing all of the beats. And the rain sort of served as that appetizer. But then we get into the other singles and the next one dropped and it was Sock It To Me. And Sock It To Me was more of a singing track, but it still hit hard because that beat was crazy. Then you had the feature with the brat on there. So in that video was a video that was visually out of this world as well. So it was like taking that package deal, taking a song that was incredible sonically, as they mentioned in the video, and then taking that visual wonderland and just stretching the boundaries of what had been done before and really just having that point of differentiation. That's really what Missy and Timbaland brought. It was unlike anything else that you saw in the music industry. Like you're so used to if you're doing a puzzle or, you know, the puzzle pieces fit here and this is what fits here. So then all of a sudden the puzzles start to become repeatable, repeatable. They're copies of themselves. But then you get a puzzle where the pieces aren't conventional and the designs are sort of like, well, how do I put this here with that there? Always kind of had you guessing always kind of had you to think, okay, well, what, what is that that I just heard there? That drum sound or that vocal sample or that sound effect or, you know, what is she doing here stylistically with her rhymes? And, oh, now she's singing. What it was was just something that people latched on to because it was so different. And sonically, it was so different from just a regular, I would guess you would say, sample-based hip-hop or when it came to the beats in regards like the drum samples or even the bass lines that would be out of this world. People just really were drawn to that and they were drawn to Missy because Missy had, as the article mentioned, she had like a unique personality. Obviously, it was very fun at times, playful. It was also that, you know, she had a commanding presence, but it wasn't overbearing. And at times it also looked like she was just like having fun with it. And I think that's what everybody really likes about artists like Missy is that when the it's sonically pleasing and when it's different, when it shows as though that they're having fun it tends to connect with the audience on a little bit of a different level. So I think I would count myself in that as well, because being a fan of music and wanting to learn to produce as well, what Timbaland was doing was absolutely insane on this album. And you heard a little bit of it on Aaliyah's One in a Million, but I feel like on this album, he really kind of took his versatility and brought it to the next level. And he would take that level and maintain it well throughout the rest of the 90s into the 2000s, to the point where we're after outside of the 2000s where he's now a certified legend, not just in the hip hop game, but he had crossed over into pop music and became a global and worldwide producing superstar. The article mentioned about Missy and her many talents. I mean, she's a quintuple threat. She could sing, she could rap, she could dance, she could write songs and she could produce. And when you talk about somebody that has that many talents, there aren't many people that have all of those talents all together. And you would think like, you know, hey, it's kind of hard for someone to do all that, cannot excel in one thing versus the other. But I think she kind of did all of those equally well. And I think it also speaks to a point of how rare an instance like Missy was. Now, Missy was, you know, and I had to put it out there like that, but she was darker skinned. She was a little bit overweight, but she definitely carried herself well. Those type of women, especially in that period 
of the music industry and Hollywood and entertainment weren't necessarily the ones that people wanted at the forefront of the game and of the industry to be faces of the industry. She sort of struck out against that because her music was so damn good. And because she was such a personality that people wanted to see, wanted to hear, they wanted to know more about her and her results were undeniable from the things that she was involved in. It was like, Hey, Missy's involved with it along with Timberland. It's going to be gold. It's going to be golden. That I think to me was also groundbreaking in the fact that she didn't have to look like, Oh, whoever some of these baby face dolls and you know, whatever her skin tone was or her body had to look like this, like, no, she was just so dope that it didn't even really matter about any of those things. You couldn't deny Missy from her spot from where she was. But she was ultra talented. Obviously, I would say musically, it was a unicorn as far, as far as her style was concerned. I mean, she was writing rhymes. She was singing and has an amazing singing voice. Songwriting and producing wise, she's great. And she had a great chemistry with Timbaland. And then what Timbaland was doing, the fact that he worked with Devontae Swing Mob, it's like he took what he learned along the way and made a unique production style all of his own. Probably, and I don't think I'm too far off base saying this, probably the most distinct and unique producing style, at least hip hop wise of all time. The fact that he was so different, the fact that he stepped outside of boundaries that many other producers weren't willing to do. The fact that there are things that he does in his production, tips and tricks and these little hallmarks that appear in this production when you hear it by another producer nowadays you're like yeah that's something that he got from Timbaland because Timbaland was the first to do it I think that this album helped solidify him as a versatile producer and it I mean when you hear it you hear hip-hop beats here and heavy hip-hop beats here when he can do hip-hop he did hip-hop and when he wanted to do R&B stuff he did R&B stuff where it wasn't sugary r&b or typical r&b it was definitely non-traditional but it was r&b all the same and as he would show later on that decade into the 2000s working with justin timberlake and nelly Furtado, he could definitely cross over into pop and when he did that like i said he stepped over into a new stratosphere highlights and lowlights so my highlights on here um definitely the singles i mean obviously we talked about socket to me in the rain The rain was just something, like I said, it went off like a bomb when it dropped. It was all over the radio. The video was all over the box, all over Rap City, even MTV. You couldn't escape it. That video for Socket to Me, that song for Socket to Me, something that stuck with people for a very long time. But other songs as well that were highlights to me. I did like Hit Him With The Heat. That featured Lil' Kim. Lil' Kim also was in the Socket to Me video as well. But that also introduced us to Mocha. Another song that I really love is Izzy Izzy Ah. I mean, it's to me, I think that this is a a song where you hear Missy mostly singing on a lot of these songs. But I felt like she did some good rhyming on this as well. Pass the Blunt, I definitely have to give her props on that. This is a take on the Pass the Duchy by Musical Youth. Obviously, the reggae song of the 80s. Um, For those of y'all who have been out there watching Stranger Things. It was just featured in season four of that. A couple of R&B joints that are definitely highlights to me on here are Friendly Skies with Genuine and Best Friends with Aaliyah. This reminds me of the click that they had, this black ground click that included Missy and Timbo with Genuine and Aaliyah and then also Magoo. But, you know, just how tight knit that group was and them collaborating with each other and I love hearing Missy on tracks with Genuine and also with Dalia. You can definitely tell that their chemistry is great. And that Friendly Skies joint is something that you listen to it. Just again, and we'll get into Tim's beats in a second. Just hearing that sort of like whatever that vocal sample that you heard on Pony while Genuine is singing as well. Tim's very, very clever in his production in that way. And I loved how he integrated that into that song. And then Best Friends with Aaliyah, one of my favorite joints on there. It really, to me, strikes to a relationship that Missy and Aaliyah had that you just only wish that they would have had more time to produce more music with each other. Like, you'd only imagine that later on in the 2000s, what Missy and Aaliyah could have done with each other, singing on tracks and also having Missy produce more stuff for Aaliyah. I mean, crazy, absolutely crazy. And then to me, One of my favorite songs, just might be my favorite song on here, is Why You Hurt Me. 
to me on this song, I think Missy does some of her best rapping. It's probably my favorite song overall on this joint. The whole story about Tootie and about the things that she did with guys and what it led to her, her being hurt. I mean, the storytelling on this kind of to me taking another element of Missy and making her just showing again, showing that versatility, showing the different things that she can do and the type of songs that she can produce and write. And this to me is about as versatile as a track that she put out on this album. This is probably my favorite joint overall, definitely. And then my last highlight on this, Getaway. And I love Getaway because it was a great song, introduces us both to space and also to Nicole Ray. And Nicole Ray would be prominent heading into the next year with Make It Hot and so many other songs that she featured on like Hot Boys later on. For that to be the last song was an appropriate last song. So those are my highlights. As far as lowlights are concerned, I love, love, love the beat on Beat Me 911 and love hearing 702 on there, but I'm not a big fan of Magoo. <laughs> Never really have been a, a great fan of Magoo. I'm not really a huge fan of They Don't Want to Fuck With Me either. It's just, mm, I don't really know. Mm, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, really. And then I'm talking. I, I'm kind of like lukewarm on that one as well. So, I mean, just three out of those three. And those three are not really like complete failures. They're not like, oh, I need to skip this shit. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So out of those, I mean, I, just a couple of like kind of low lights or things that I can kind of do without or things that I'm lukewarm on. But just to speak to Tim's beats on here. Now, I love Timberland's beats and the beats that I love on here, other than, of course, Socket to Me and The Rain, uh, I mentioned about Beat Me 911 with 702 and Magoo, but, you know, production wise on this joint sort of lets you know, like, definitely typical Timberland beat. And this is like one of those beats that lets me know when you hear it. Yup, that's Timberland. Yeah, that that's Timberland. Absolutely. And then you sort of get into that versatility of getting into songs like Best Friends and Why You Hurt Me and Friendly Skies. But then being able to also then get songs like Izzy Izzy Ah and beats like Don't Be Coming In My Face and that give you those hard hitting drums. Also that bass line, those drums and bass lines that Timberland is known for, those sound effects that Timberland has known for that he incorporates so cleverly in his production that he became very well known for in the late 90s into the early 2000s that gave his production some sort of appeal because it was different. So all those 10 beats definitely were beats to note. I mean, there isn't a bad beat on here. I even think that I love how he switches it up so that everything doesn't sort of sound repetitive because we all know and we love that those drum patterns that Tim has, those bass lines that he gives us, those vocal effects and sound effects, but don't want too much of it, especially don't want things to seem repetitive after a little while. The differentiation on here definitely helps to make the album a great album and helps to definitely make it flow as well. Final verdict. So after looking at Super Duper Fly, I definitely want to say that this is a, this is definitely an album that made an impact. It's an album that legacy-wise influenced a lot of not only rappers in some respect and also some singers, some songwriters, and absolutely some producers. <laughs> I know that this is an album that a lot of producers definitely took some things and tried to incorporate it in their own productions as the years passed. As a matter of fact, on past the blunt Messi mentions in the beginning of the song about producers trying to imitate Timberland. And this would be something that would be sort of a topic of conversation for the rest of the nineties into the two thousands, because you can definitely tell there were producers out there that were trying to steal from Timberland, but couldn't quite do it like the way that he could. So this album is influential in that respect. I think the fact that it's different, that the fact that it's sonically very pleasing and visually they took that into their music to sort of match the sonic excellence that they got through producing the album. But I also take a little bit into consideration what, Missy and Timbaland have done since then. And I know I don't try to get into the whole comparison game because as they often say, comparison is a thief of joy. But, you know, I would say there are some definite bangers here. But I would also say after 25 years and seeing so much more from Missy in that time, I do think that after a while, if we would have known what was coming after this, that we definitely would say this is a unique and a dope album. 
It is definitely trendsetting in some respects. But in regards to its classic rating, at this point, I'm going to have to give it a borderline classic. And I'm going to say it's a borderline classic overall, only because I think that while there are some bangers on this, I do believe that some of the other songs that I listed as lowlights do bring the overall level of the album down just a little bit. But there are some classic joints on here without a shadow of a doubt. And I think doing all of this in just two weeks is definitely a monumental feat. I mean, (laughs) doing all of this in two weeks, meaning you recording it, producing, editing, mastering, all those things being done in just two weeks is absolutely insane. That is like alien type work. (laughs) If you want to like seriously, but to me, I mean, I look at other albums that Missy has done and I feel as though like her best was only yet to come as a result of this. The fact that she would follow this up with the real world and Later on, there would be Missy So Addictive, and then there would be Under Construction, like, and there would be so many other massive hits that she would have as a result of that. This is not a test. So there were, like, so many other albums that followed after this that, to me, I think probably stand up a little bit better than this one does. I think that without a shadow of a doubt, this album laid the foundation of so many different things, not just for Missy. But in the industry also laid a lot of foundations for things that singers, rappers and producers took from this and attempted to duplicate later on, even not to the same level. But I would definitely have to say for me, borderline classic. I think that the legacy of this in regards to how different it was, and I think it forced people to think outside of the box because they knew that bringing the cookie cutter stuff in some respects really wouldn't work because of how different this was and how the public also responded to it. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and say borderline classic. Um, I'm going to give it a rating of a nine out of 10. I, you know, kind of believe that, you know, Hey, if we could have replaced some of the other weaker ones on here or the not as good songs on here that we definitely be on certified classic status, but this is definitely a dope, dope album trend setting in so many different respects So make sure y'all go check out Missy Super Duper Fly, 25 years old this week. Shout out to Missy and to Timbaland for doing their thing on this one. But make sure y'all check it out, man. See if you can get it on vinyl as well. And hit us up. Let us know what you think, man. What do you think about Missy Super Duper Fly, 25 years? Just give us that and also your first impressions when you heard The Rain or Sakutemi or the album overall. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are checking us out on our host on Red Circle. You can also check us out at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. You can go there, view our episodes, listen to them, leave reviews. Also leave us a voice note by the blue microphone shaded in the bottom right hand corner. In the bottom left hand corner, you can click on the coffee cup. That's our buy me a coffee page. You can click on that and leave us a small monetary donation to make sure we can continue keeping the vault open for years to come. You can also visit us on social media at Vault Classic Pod on Instagram, at Vault Classic on Twitter, and on Facebook and YouTube. You can search us, the Vault Classic Music Reviews Podcast. Also on TikTok, make sure you are following us at Vault Classic Pod and shout out to those of y'all who already are. We want so many more of you all to join us. We appreciate the support and if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud but not too loud and as we close, we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate, and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and visit us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com.